sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Joel 2, verses 12 to 14. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. And the third is from Micah 6, 8. <clears throat> he has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I want to tell you that when I was at the hospital, that was a long day. You know, again, how patient I am. <laughs> uh, I had the opportunity of waiting. You have to see everything that happens as God leading. Okay? And uh, since I'm sitting down and I have to wait, I start saying something like comical, like, you're wondering why we call this meeting this day. <laughs> Everybody laughs and relax, you know, and then I start talking to some people and before you know it, I am evangelizing and I'm sharing the gospel with someone. And we had that opportunity twice. You know, sharing the gospel uh, and believing that, you know, we're supposed to sow the seed and let God water the seed. See? So what I'm saying there, when you have to wait, maybe God has someone for you to talk to. You never know. And share your testimony. And I think the majority of us should learn how to share our testimony in two minutes, ten minutes, or half an hour. And sometimes that's all you need, two minutes to share the word of God. And you'd be surprised the impact that will make on that person's life. Well, we're going back to God's grand story this morning. A very vocal God. Quickly to review, and the first message that I share, and by the way, they are all in the website. to pick them up if you want to uh, listen to them. We talked about Abraham, how he separated himself. God called him to leave the city earth, and he separated himself from all that was outside the will of God for his life. Everything that was outside the will of God for his life, and separation from to all that is within the will of God for his life. And we expanded on that. He was very committed to God, and because he was very committed to God, he was walking in the presence of God. He was living under the promises of God. He was living under the protection of God, the special power of God, and provision of God. Then we talked about Joshua, a protege of Moses. He was a great example and an excellent leader. And we talked about those qualities that he had. He was confident, confident in God's strength, confident. And he was courageous in the face of opposition. And he was willing to seek God's advice. In other words, Joshua led the Israelites to the promised land and he eliminated the enemy. I mean, the first tribe that he was confronted with was the walls of Jericho. And God told him to go swimming? No. He told him to do what? Walk around it. How many times? Seven times. And the seventh time, they had to do it seven times, right? Now imagine, imagine you. You come to me and you have a problem. And I tell you, you know, listen, go to the arena. All right? And walk around it seven times, stop walking around it seven times again, what do you think that guy will think I'm doing? He will think I'm crazy, right? Right? <laughs> but then again, there's some people who will take that word to heart and do it too. You see? And that was the kind of thing that he was faced with. Joshua. Well, 
He led them to victory. And for us, for us, we need to regain the land that we lost to the enemy. We need to defeat those strongholds through, with, through Christ our victor. What strongholds? The stronghold of addiction, the stronghold of anger, the stronghold of depression. And I'm not talking about chemical imbalance there. That's a whole different story. The stronghold of promiscuous, sexual problem, relationships. Some of us are faced with those strongholds and they keep us defeated. And we need to be delivered, amen, from those strongholds. So now we turn to the next message, a very vocal God. But first let me share with you some history which is essential, very essential, my friends, to understanding where we're going. We know that Joshua entered the promised land and he was full of God's power, he was full of God's wisdom, he was full of God's discernment, and he was obedient to God. And they had victory after victory after victory. But after Joshua died, we entered the period of Judges. Quickly, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay? Then come Joshua, right? After Joshua comes Judges. Right? Keep that in mind. During this time they had to wage, I mean, ceaseless wars of defense to maintain the land that they had. And every time a nation attacked the Israelites, God's Spirit came upon a person. A man or a woman. And we still have denominations out there that don't believe in women being anointed to preach the word of God. And here we have God choosing Deborah. And you can read the story of Deborah and Samson. That's not just a comic book experience. That was real. And other judges like Gideon. Oh, the story of Gideon is fantastic. Talking about low self-esteem and low self-worth. I mean, that guy used to walk around like this. Nobody likes me. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Nobody likes me. What can I do? I cannot do anything. You know, I'm a failure. I'm a bum. I'm a... Not with God. God comes. He comes and enters that life. And God is able to empower. God is able to heal the low self-worth and the low self-esteem that you're going through. And give you confidence in Him. And you'll be able to say, I can do all things through Jesus Christ. So after Judges, you have 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, all history of Israel. And the enemy pressure became so intense that they, and Randy talked about this, that they had a monarchy uh, establishment. God was no longer controlled. So under King David and under King Solomon, 1000 BC to 922 BC, Canaan became an Israelite empire which took its place proudly in the circle of nations, a strong empire. They were powerful. But after Solomon died, the kingdom was divided. Israel with ten tribes to the north, and Judah with ten, two stripes, stripes, he had tribes to the south. And the history of both north and south is filled with disobedience and idolatry. And you find that first and second Samuel and first and second Kings and Chronicles. The people were not living up to their calling. And God was grief. He did not remain silent. He patiently called them back to himself through his prophets. And this is where we have those prophets like Joel, Joel, Amos, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. We have also, if you want to read an interesting story, read the book of Hosea. 
a prostitute. I tell you, the Bible doesn't hold anything back. A prostitute whose husband keeps searching, to, going after her because she keeps committing adultery and adultery, but he keeps taking her back. And that's a description of God with the Israelites. And that's the description of with us sometimes that God wants to bring us back. But we have that tendency to go back to the world and try the world again and taste the world again. Sometimes it was a message the prophet spoke of God's many promises of restoration and a future deliverer. It talks about the second coming of Christ. You do know he's coming back. But we have a major problem. The people were not only being disobedient, but they were also committing spiritual adultery. Listen, unfaithfulness is a matter of the heart. Don't, doesn't Jeremiah tell us the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure? Who can understand it? Or Mark chapter 7 verse 21. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. From within out of man's heart comes evil thoughts. <coughs> the people of Judah have become prosperous and complacent taking God for granted. They had turned to self centeredness idolatry, and sin. And Joel warned them that this kind of lifestyle would inevitably bring down God's judgment. Listen. God had laid out the terms long ago in Deuteronomy 28 and Joshua 24. That's why Joshua came to that point in his life when he says, as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. You can do what you want to do, but as for me and my family, we're going to serve God. There's no other place to get the help that you need. We need God. Follow me. Not only did he lay out the terms long ago, but for the people, he laid out the consequences that would happen to them. But Israel and Judah repeatedly failed to live up to the covenant. Listen, this is what's not a matter of works, but of the heart. And if your heart is right, when you gladly do the work of God, when you keep that relationship with God, or as Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. People were committing adultery, unfaithfulness against God. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like today? And God was challenging them with strong warnings about the consequences of their actions. I mean, read the book of Hosea and Ezekiel. God gave them warning after warning for centuries. Especially towards the end. And he called them back to himself. Now we get to personal application. Questions for you to think about. In what areas do you have a hard time being faithful to God? Think about that. God, listen carefully, God is calling out to us this morning. Pastor, what is God saying this morning? My friends, God has made a covenant with us. And the terms were very practical. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Jesus added, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. There you go, Pastor Valentine. You had to go and get meddling in my life. You had to talk to me about loving myself and loving my, my, my neighbor who happens to be my enemy. you got to be kidding. No. No. This is all expected of us. And that simply means to be joined with Christ and live in union with Him. As we have seen, our hearts matter to God. Our love is important to Him. Follow me. When we are casual about it, 
It literally grieves his heart. He is not an obscure, silent God. Though sometimes we feel like he is silent, especially when we go through the, the major storms in life. Don't you think the Atkinsons right now are going through a storm? Children of God, God calls out to us. He speaks to his people. He especially calls us back when we have gone astray. Hey, that's very easy to do. It doesn't take long. Is that you out there sitting comfortably in your pew and God's voice is clear and you can hear God's voice. My son, my daughter, you're not happy. There's no joy in your soul. You're not happy in church and you're not happy in the world. What are the high stakes? Well, on the positive side, they had life in the new land. They had God's blessing, and they were a light to the other nations. The word was out there, don't go rumbling with Israel. They go outside your head. Don't mess with them. Thank you. Continue to say amen. I'll take it. The word was out. On the negative side, no obedience. Judgment. And the prophets prophesy the day of the Lord is at hand. Oh, if you like to study the Bible, take that phrase and look it up for the Old Testament. The day of the Lord is at hand. And that day is coming soon. Discipline will take place. God is calling his people for a time of restoration. God will never leave you alone. The hound of heaven, as Dr. David Seaman is talking about, C.S. Lewis, the hound of heaven will run after you. And when restoration takes place, we are called to represent him to the world. But again, but, oh, that special word, but, but instead, they gave a distorted picture of him that grieved his heart. Is that you this morning? When they look at you, imagine, imagine me, Friday, sitting down, instead of talking to people, complaining, they say, doggone it, what's wrong with these people? Don't they know I have a schedule to follow? You know, what's wrong with these people? I mean, gotta do something about this hospital. That would be a beautiful testimony. Eh? Right, Dave? Yeah? They told me that you were a nice guy. He went there for major surgery. And him and his wife, both of them were dedicated and believed in God. And God gave them peace for that major surgery. And I'm talking about sometimes we're not good witnesses. It grieves God's heart when we are a poor witness to other individuals. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty? Again, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Listen, if a seasoning has no flavor, it has no value. If we as Christians make no effort to affect the world around us, then we are of little value to God. If we are too much like the world, we are worthless. Christians should not blend in with everyone else. They say, well, time out, Pastor Valentine. Time out here. You told us before. You told us that if we're Christians and don't have any, you know, unbeliever as friends, shame, shame on you. No. You have friends who are unbelievers. Yes, you mingle with them. But you don't blend. You don't do everything they do. You take a stand. You love them no matter what, right? I always tell you, you're welcome here. You come the way you are. And I don't care what kind of life you have to live. You're welcome. Because, see, I know someone, and that someone has the power to change your life. I think they call him Jesus. <clears throat> Oh, 
Then Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. And the same way, he says, let your light shine before men. This little light of mine. <laughs> Sing it, people. <laughs> Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hey, remember that song? Yes. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. If we live for Christ, we will glow like lights, showing others what Christ is like. We are, we are, you know, we hide our light. You know how we hide our light? They are put them out there. This is how we hide our light. Number one, being quiet when we should speak. <coughs> Going along with the crowd. You could go along with them, but don't repeat what they do. Denying the light. Somebody says, Are you a Christian? Oh, no. I'm, I'm not one of those religious people. I'm not one of those crazy people, fanatics. No. I'm not a Christian. We deny the light, letting sin dim our light. Not explaining our light to other people when they ask you, there's something different about you. What is it? Not explaining our life to others or ignoring the needs of others. Oh, that's a good one. They don't want to hear what you have to tell them unless you feed them and clothe them and look after them and help them. No, they did the opposite. They treated a sacred calling as though it was not sacred. So they swander the blessings he had promised in pursuit of their own interests and idols. Personal application, again, you and your questions, Pastor. It helps us to think. What is at stake in your life as you live out your relationship with God and other people? In what ways are you an expression of Him to the world around you? See, God tells us that we have choices. And those choices have consequences. So think of a choice you made what were the consequences? The Israelites made the wrong choice. And the consequences were no good. But, but, oh, that word again, oh. But the call of the prophet's message was this. This is what the call was. Return to me. Ezekiel says, I will give you, if you come back to God, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a new heart and put a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. My friends, God is not focused on judgment. He is focused on restoration. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Don't we realize that Jesus' ministry embodied a truth that was beyond most people's comprehension? God welcomes repentant sinners with undiluted joy and gladness, MacArthur says. And listen carefully. Heaven's joy over the redemption of sinners is an ecstatic, euphoric, over-the-top, over-the-top kind of exaltation, MacArthur tells us. God, listen to this, if you don't get anything, please get this, God is merciful. He's not short on mercy. And any time we return to Him, to understand, he receives us 
even at the last moment when you're taking your last breath before you die, if you return to him, even at that moment, he will receive you. We need to understand when God disciplines us, when he allows trials and tribulations and pain or suffering, he will work it together for our good and use it for his purposes. And through all those storms, he's working his perfect plan. Purpose for your life. A desire to draw us into a deep relationship with him. And my friends, bless us through that relationship. And listen, he enables us to be everything he wants us to be. And I'm finishing over here. And no matter what happens, we are still his treasure possession. And he will accomplish his will for the good of his kingdom and for our benefit. In conclusion, God has placed his affection on us. And we are always living in his love. But within that relationship, we have a high stake choices to make. We will pursue him with all hearts and become a reflection of his glory. Or we will neglect that relationship and pursue our own interests. Squandering the gifts and calling he has offered. God wants us to say yes to him. The world needs us to say yes to him. And we are blessed by saying yes to him. I am not going to close this service just like that. I am positive there are people here that you need to be restored back to faith in God. I am positive there are people here that your relationship with him is complacent, is casual. And your interest for the things of God are decreasing constantly. And God is calling you saying, come to me, come to me. I know what you're doing, I know the life that you're living, I know the lifestyle, I know what's going on, I, about, I know about the problems, the people, everything. Come back to me. Come and surrender. And at the same time, if there are people here who need a physical touch, Randy and I are ready to anoint you with oil. Listen, what happened to me was a miracle. I have to be honest with you. I went in there expecting a triple bypass. <coughs> so I went through a lot of pain. I was having a lot of pain and discomfort. But God had another plan. Where is your faith, my dear angel? Haven't I touched you before? Where is your faith, my son, my daughter? Come, be anointed, and expect God to heal you and touch your life. Or come and restore, be restored back to him. Come and recommit your life, rededicate your life. Come on, be, be, be honest. Your life without God is not good, you know it. A lot of problems, a lot of issues, a lot of relationships, a lot of things going on. Well, he can help you. He can help you. As he has helped many people. 